Summary, Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life, Marshall Rosenberg. Book link. Click here here is a summary of the book Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life by Marshall Rosenberg. Nonviolent communication is a method of communicating that allows us to exchange information in a respectful, empathetic way. It focuses on revealing our observations, feelings, needs, and requests to improve mutual understanding and resolve conflicts peacefully. The critical principles of NVC are, observe without evaluating. Make observations by describing specific actions and events, rather than judging or labeling people. Identify and express feelings. Express how you feel without blaming others. Use I statements and take responsibility for your feelings. Identify and express unmet needs. Explain the needs, values, desires, etc., creating your feelings. Our needs are what motivate our actions and feelings. Make requests, not demands. Express concrete actions that others can take to meet your needs. Make requests, not commands, and leave room for others to say no. Practicing NVC improves relationships by helping us connect at the level of needs and find mutually agreeable solutions. It fosters empathy and compassion, even in difficult situations, by focusing on our humanity. NVC has applications in many areas of life, including personal relationships, parenting, teaching, counseling, negotiation, and conflict resolution. It provides a framework for cooperative problem-solving and addressing complex challenges. The ultimate goal of NVC is to establish a flow of empathy between ourselves and others so we can live together peacefully. By consistently applying its principles, NVC can transform how we communicate and bring more harmony to the world. Here is a summary of the reviews and endorsements. Jane Lazar is a Zen student and NVC trainer. Reviewers praise her book, Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life, for transforming relationships and communication. They say it can help reduce conflict and frustrations, clarify thinking, and promote compassion. Spirituality leaders see NVC as compatible with and complementary to spiritual practices like Buddhism. They say it can cultivate clarity, compassion, and liberation. Educators value teaching NVC to promote self-awareness, empathy, and improve relationships. They report students and teachers benefiting from learning and applying NVC. Therapists and mediators praise NVC for improving empathy compassion, and conflict resolution skills. They say it helps clients develop emotional awareness and improves relationships. Business leaders like Tony Robbins recommend NVC for improving communication, relationships, and quality of life. They say it leads to more successful outcomes and transforming businesses. Reviewers praise the book for its simple but powerful lessons and examples in clear, compelling writing. They say NVC takes practice but can have life-changing effects. The strategies help people connect deeper, resolve conflicts, reduce anger and judgments, and promote mutual understanding. In summary, reviewers and leaders across various fields highly recommend nonviolent communication for its ability to profoundly improve relationships, compassion, emotional awareness, conflict resolution, and communication. They say reading and applying the lessons from this book can be transformative. Here is a summary. Marshall Rosenberg has devoted his life to understanding what disconnects us from our compassionate nature and what allows some to remain connected to it. His interest in this began in childhood, around 1943, when a race war erupted in Detroit, where his family had just moved. Over 40 people were killed, and his neighborhood was at the center of the violence. They spent days locked in their home. When school began, he discovered that a name could be as dangerous as skin color. When his name was called, two boys asked angrily if he was a Kike an anti-Semitic slur. He had not heard the term before. This incident made him aware of the danger of prejudice and violence, shaping his desire to transcend violence and connect with our shared humanity. The fundamental principles of nonviolent communication that he has developed are, observing without evaluating identifying and expressing feelings connecting feelings to needs requesting that which would enrich life the goal is to inspire compassion and strengthen the flow of communication needed for violence to end. We must develop a giving from the heart a mutually compassionate connection with others. Rosenberg believes all human beings have the capacity for compassion, and it is our nature to give and receive compassionately. However, violence and exploitation are learned behaviors, while compassion is inborn. The key is understanding what allows some to stay connected to their compassionate nature. That covers the essence and key points from the introduction. Please let me know if you want me to explain or summarize anything in the passage in more detail. Here is a summary. Marshall Rosenberg developed Nonviolent Communication, NVC, to strengthen compassion in our communication. NVC consists of four components, 
observations, observe the actions affecting you in the situation. Express what people are doing that you either like or do not like without judgment. Feelings, identify how you feel when you observe the action. Express your emotions, for example hurt, scared, joyful, irritated. Needs, connect your feelings to your needs that are met or unmet. Express what needs of yours are connected to the feelings. Requests, request to enrich your life by addressing what you want from the other person. Express what they can do to meet your needs. The NVC process involves expressing these four components to others and receiving them through empathetic listening. The essence of NVC lies in being conscious of these four pieces of information, not just the words exchanged. This establishes a flow of compassionate communication back and forth until mutual understanding is reached. NVC aims to strengthen compassion in our communication by training our attention on expressing and understanding each other's observations, feelings, needs, and requests. This allows us to connect in a way that enhances both parties' well-being. Here is a summary, expressing honestly through the four components, observation, what one sees slash hears slash touches without judgment feeling, how one feels about what one observes need, the need that is the root cause of the feeling request, the specific action one would like in order to meet the need receiving empathically through the four components, observation, what the other person sees slash hears slash touches without judgment feeling, how the other person feels about what they observe need the underlying need causing the other person's feeling request, the specific action the other person would like in order to meet the need NVC helps to connect with oneself and others by, focusing on observations, feelings, needs, and requests deep listening with empathy and respect engendering a mutual desire to give from the heart some applications of NVC, personal relationships, to increase depth in caring professional relationships, to build effectiveness political arena, to resolve conflicts and mediate disputes worldwide, as a resource for communities in conflict the dialogues show NVC in action with the intent to convey the spirit and consciousness of NVC which can be expressed through words as well as silence, presence, facial expressions, and body language. The dialogues are distilled versions of real exchanges with more elements than words. An example dialogue shows Marshall Rosenberg using NVC with angry Palestinian men who call him names like murderer and assassin. Rosenberg responds with empathy by guessing at the feeling and need, anger due to wanting support in improving living conditions and gaining their own country. The dialogue continues with the man expressing more about their difficult situation. Here's a summary, moralistic judgments, where people label others as good or bad based on whether they align with specific values, alienate us from compassion. Rather than directly articulating our needs and values, we insinuate wrongness in others for not meeting them. This thinking promotes violence, as we see bad people as deserving punishment. Making comparisons of ourselves to others, as in comparing our achievements or attributes to some ideal standard, also blocks compassion. These comparisons make us feel inadequate and miserable. In general, language and thinking that classifies and judges people hinder compassion. A more compassionate way of communicating articulates our needs and values directly, rather than judging others for not meeting them. Here is a summary. The passage discusses how certain forms of communication can alienate us from life and block compassion. Some examples include, using moralistic judgments that imply wrongness or badness in others. This causes people to look outside themselves to determine right and wrong, rather than listening to their feelings and needs. Making comparisons between people can hinder compassion for others and oneself. Denying personal responsibility for one's thoughts, feelings, and actions by attributing them to external causes. This is exemplified using phrases like I had to or I have no choice. Replacing this language with one's acknowledging choice and responsibility, such as I choose to because I want, can help increase awareness of personal responsibility. Communicating desires through demands, which threaten punishment for non-compliance. We can never force people to do anything against their will. Judging that people deserve reward or punishment based on their actions. This stems from a view of human nature as inherently evil, and blocks compassion. These forms of communication originate from and perpetuate hierarchical societies where people are controlled by being conditioned to judge themselves and others harshly. Compassionate communication helps free us from this conditioning to connect with others' feelings and needs. The key to compassionate communication is observing without judgment or evaluation. We need to differentiate between observations and interpretations slash evaluations, and avoid mixing the two. Observations are factual descriptions of what happened, while evaluations add judgment and imply wrongness. Making this distinction clear can help resolve conflicts and facilitate understanding. Here is a summary. The first component of nonviolent communication, NVC, is to separate observation from evaluation. We must observe what we see, hear, 
or touch without mixing in any evaluation. When we combine observation with evaluation, we decrease the likelihood that others will hear our intended message. Instead, they are apt to hear criticism and resist our words. NVC requires that we maintain a separation between our observations and our evaluations. Evaluations are to be based on observations specific to time and context. Observing without evaluating is the highest form of human intelligence, but it is difficult for most of us. We often make evaluations, especially of people and their behavior. Examples show how to distinguish observations separate from evaluation from those that have evaluation mixed in, using verbs, adverbs, verb forms, and word choice. Words like always, never, ever, whenever, frequently, and seldom can contribute to confusing observation with evaluation. When used as exaggerations, they often provoke defensiveness. Used carefully, they can express observations. The key is to be specific and take responsibility for our evaluations and interpretations rather than implying they are the only ones possible or confusing them with observations. Here is a summary. Observation should be specific to time and context. For example, Hank Smith has not scored a goal in 20 games instead of Hank Smith is a poor soccer player. Avoid static generalizations. Make observations specific to time and context. For example, say Hank Smith has not scored a goal in 20 games instead of Hank Smith is a poor soccer player. Expressing feelings is the second component of NVC. However, many people cannot differentiate and express their feelings. Schools and society often discourage the expression of feelings, teaching people to focus on thinking in prescribed ways rather than connecting with their feelings. This can lead to a lack of awareness and ability to express one's feelings. The inability to express feelings can take a heavy toll on relationships and people's connections. For example, a woman said she felt married to a wall because her husband rarely expressed his feelings. To express feelings that invite connection, share how you feel without criticism, judgment, or demands. For example, I feel lonely and want more emotional contact. Rather than I feel like I am living with a wall. The latter is more likely to be heard as criticism. Expressing feelings and emotional needs is necessary for intimacy and close relationships. When those abilities are lacking, people often feel lonely, disconnected and unsatisfied in their relationships. That covers the key highlights from the evaluation on identifying and expressing feelings according to the principles of NVC. Please let me know if you want me to explain or expand on any summary part. Here is a summary. We must build our emotional vocabulary to better connect and express our feelings to others. Lacking the words to describe our emotions leads to poor communication and prevents closeness in relationships. Statements that start with I feel like you, or I feel that, often reflect thoughts rather than actual feelings. It is better to use words directly referring to emotions, such as I feel anxious or I feel frustrated. Distinguish between words that describe feelings and those that describe judgments about others' behaviors, such as I feel ignored or I feel unimportant. Those reflect interpretations rather than feelings. The actual feelings in those cases might be hurt, sad, or discouraged. Use specific emotion words rather than vague terms like good or bad. Words like happy, excited, relieved, or ecstatic are more descriptive and help others understand you better. Expanding our emotional vocabulary and clearly articulating our feelings can help resolve conflicts, enable vulnerability and intimacy in relationships, and improve communication at work or other areas of life. Expressing feelings honestly and compassionately can transform interactions and facilitate understanding. Two lists provide examples of words to describe feelings when our needs are met. For example, joyous, serene, hopeful, or unmet. For example, afraid, annoyed, disappointed. A rich vocabulary of emotional words to draw from empowers us to express the full range of human feelings. The critical benefits of strengthening our ability to express feelings caringly include resolving conflicts, enabling closeness in relationships, improving communication at work, and transforming complex interactions. Connecting with our feelings and sharing them with empathy help create understanding between people. Here is a summary of the feelings, negative feelings, distressed, disturbed, downcast, downhearted, dull, edgy, embarrassed, embittered, exasperated, exhausted, fatigued, fearful, fidgety, forlorn, frightened, frustrated, furious, gloomy, guilty, harried, heavy, helpless, hesitant, horrible, horrified, hostile, hot, humdrum, hurt, impatient, indifferent, intense, irate, irked, irritated, jealous, jittery, keyed up, lazy, leery, lethargic, listless, lonely, mad, mean, miserable, mope, morose, mournful, nervous, nettled, numb, overwhelmed, 
panicky, passive, perplexed, pessimistic, puzzled, rancorous, reluctant, repelled, resentful, restless, sad, scared, sensitive, shaky, shocked, skeptical, sleepy, sorrowful, sorry, spiritless, startled, surprised, suspicious, tepid, terrified, tired, troubled, uncomfortable, unconcerned, uneasy, unglued, unhappy, unnerved, unsteady, upset, uptight, vexed, weary, wistful, withdrawn, woeful, worried, wretched. Positive feelings, calm, comfortable, encouraged, energetic, excited, friendly, glad, good, happy, hearty, hopeful, interested, joyful, kind, lively, pleasant, relaxed, safe, satisfied, firm, thankful, thrilled, warm. Here's a summary. The cause of the parent's happiness or unhappiness lies within themselves, not in the child. While it may seem that the child is responsible for the parent's feelings by caring for them, this is an illusion. If the child changes their behavior primarily to avoid feelings of guilt in the parent, they are not acting with compassion but rather to avoid negative consequences. Genuine compassion comes from within, not from a sense of obligation or duty. When we express our needs indirectly through judgment, criticism or interpretation of others, they become defensive as they perceive it as an attack. However, when we express our own needs directly and honestly, it allows others to respond with empathy and care. Most people have yet to learn to identify and express their needs clearly. Instead, we tend to focus on what is wrong with others when our needs are unmet. We must express our needs directly instead of through judgment and criticism to build trust and cooperation. Some basic human needs we all share include, autonomy, celebration, integrity, interdependence, play, spiritual communion and physical nurturance. Expressing our needs can be frightening, especially for women who are socialized to sacrifice their needs for others. If we do not value our own needs, others will not either. Not expressing needs clearly can lead to anger, resentment and conflict in relationships. It is an arduous journey to move from emotional slavery, where we feel responsible for others' feelings, to emotional liberation, where we acknowledge our own needs and express them honestly while caring for others from a place of compassion. However, it is a journey worth making to build healthier, mutually supportive relationships. The key message is that we must clearly identify, value and express our needs to have compassionate, authentic relationships. Emotional slavery helps no one, emotional liberation benefits all. When we take responsibility for our feelings and needs, we can give to others from a place of care rather than obligation. This is the path to free and loving relationships. Here is a summary, the feelings and needs of our partners can negatively impact intimate relationships. Some people feel overwhelmed when they see their partner in distress and feel like they lose themselves in the relationship. They feel trapped and want to escape. This is common in those who feel responsible for their partner's needs and put their own needs aside. In the first stage, emotional slavery, we feel responsible for our partner's feelings. If aware of this, we may say we cannot handle our partner's pain and must break free. If unaware, we may blame our partner for being too needy. The partner should not accept the blame but show empathy for the emotional slavery. In the second obnoxious stage, we feel angry at being responsible for our partner's feelings and assert our own needs, often rigidly. We are learning to express our needs but have not learned to do so while respecting our partner's needs. In the third stage, emotional liberation, we respond to our partner's needs with compassion, not fear, guilt, or shame. We accept responsibility for our intentions and actions but not our partner's feelings. We express our needs clearly while caring that our partner's needs are met. NVC acknowledges that others' words trigger our feelings, but our feelings stem from our needs. We have four options in responding to others' negative communication, blame ourselves, blame others, identify our own feelings slash needs, or guess at the others' feelings slash needs. Judging or criticizing others reflects our own unmet needs. Identifying our feelings and needs helps others respond with compassion. This can be hard, especially for women taught to ignore their needs. The three stages show progress toward emotional responsibility. At first we feel responsible for others' feelings. Then we reject responsibility for others' feelings. Finally we take responsibility for our intentions slash actions but not others' feelings, aware that we cannot meet our needs at the cost of others. An example shows using NVC to address a coworker's shock at teen pregnancies and believing we must stigmatize illegitimacy again. By guessing at the co-worker's observations, feelings and needs, the NVC user showed empathy for feeling astonished and annoyed. The co-worker felt hurt and moved between those feelings, allowing the NVC user to continue showing empathy. Here's a summary. Use positive language when making requests. 
request what you do want, rather than what you do not want. Harmful requests tend to confuse people and provoke resistance. The story of the woman requesting her husband not spend so much time at work illustrates this well. Her negative request backfired. A positive request, like asking him to spend one evening a week with family, would have been more explicit and more likely to be fulfilled. Marshall's experience debating the Vietnam War on TV shows how focusing on what you do not want to do can lead to doing just that. It is better to clarify what you do want to do. The high school students' experience with their principal further demonstrates this. Their harmful requests and demands provoked a defensive, angry response. When Marshall suggested positively requesting what they did want, they had more success. In summary, make explicit, positive requests to increase the likelihood of a compassionate response. Opposing demands create confusion, provoke resistance, and lead to undesired outcomes. Focus on what you do want rather than do not want. Does this summary accurately reflect the critical learnings around using positive action language to make requests? Let me know if you want want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. Summary, the key points are, use positive, concrete language when making requests. Avoid vague, abstract phrasing which can lead to confusion and unmet needs. Express what you want rather than what you do not want. This elicits a more cooperative response. Communicate your underlying feelings and needs. Requests may sound like demands when unaccompanied by the speaker's feelings and needs. Be conscious of what you are requesting. We often need to determine what we want the other person to do. The listener is then unable to respond helpfully. Guess what the other person might request when they express discomfort. Look for the underlying request, not just the words used. These principles are examples of ways to reframe requests leading to more positive interactions and outcomes. The key is making conscious, concrete requests that reveal the speaker's feelings and needs. Here is a summary, the more transparent we are about what we want from others, the more likely we will get it. We need to be conscious of precisely what we are requesting. Asking others to reflect on what we said is a way to ensure the message was understood as we intended. We should express appreciation when others try to meet our request for a reflection. If the listener gets annoyed at our request, we can empathize with their feelings. We often want honesty from others in the form of, one, their feelings, two, their thoughts, or, three, their willingness to take action. We must be concrete in requesting the specific form of honesty we want. When addressing groups, we must be clear about what response we want to avoid unproductive discussions. If the initiator of a discussion needs to be clarified, others can ask what response they want. With this clarity, much group time is well spent. We need boss consciousness, knowing when our needs have been met and it is time to move on. Our requests are heard as demands when others feel they will be blamed or punished for not complying. Demands reduce the listener's ability to respond compassionately. When people hear demands, they see only two options, submit or rebel. The more we see our power is dependent on the compliance of others, the more we make demands instead of requests. We need to connect with the human needs behind our requests and believe that others will respond out of compassion. Then our requests are more likely to be heard as requests rather than demands. The key message is that we need to be very conscious and articulate in our communication with others about what we want and need. Moreover, we must approach others with faith in their humanity and compassion, rather than viewing power as coming from their compliance or submission. With consciousness and compassion, we can make accurate requests rather than demands. Here is a summary. The more we have blamed, punished or made others feel guilty for not complying with our requests in the past, the more likely our requests will now be heard as demands. We are also affected by others using such tactics on us. To determine if it is a demand or a request, observe the speaker's reaction when the request is not fulfilled. It is likely a demand if the speaker criticizes, judges, or lays a guilt trip. If the speaker shows empathy, it is likely a genuine request. Our objective should be to establish an honest and empathic relationship. We must be conscious of this objective, especially in positions of authority. Even with awareness and care, others may still hear demands due to past experiences. It can take time for requests to be heard. Avoid thoughts that turn requests into demands, for example he should, she is supposed to, I deserve, I have a right to. These lead to judging others for non-compliance. Expressing requests requires an awareness of our objective. If our sole objective is to change others' behavior to get our way, NVC is inappropriate. The objective should be an honest relationship based on empathy. Choosing to request rather than demand does not mean giving up when hearing no. However, persuasion should only follow empathy for the other's position. The more we trust that the speaker's primary intent is the relationship, not just getting their way, 
the more we can trust that requests are genuine and not camouflage demands. It takes time for this trust to develop, especially where there was coercion in the past. Here is a summary of the key points about receiving empathically. Empathy requires presence, emptying our mind and listening with our whole being. It demands that we shed all preconceived ideas and judgments and truly listen. Empathy demands that we be fully present in each new situation in each moment. We cannot rely on past experiences or prepared reactions. We must be fully present and responsive. Giving our full attention to someone who is suffering is very difficult. It requires patience, courage, and humility. Empathy is a respectful understanding of what others are experiencing. It goes beyond just listening to the words they are saying. We must listen for the feelings and needs behind their words. Empathy allows us to see the beauty in others and to understand their experiences. It fosters compassion which helps us recognize that we are all together. Receiving empathically, like expressing honestly, takes practice. We must be patient with ourselves and willing to reflect on how we can improve. Constant self-judgment will only make us less able to be present with others. An empathic response aims to comfort by showing the other person that their feelings make sense and their needs are legitimate. We reflect an understanding of what they shared without judgment. An empathic response does not necessarily mean agreeing with the other person's perceptions or actions. We aim to understand them, not condone unacceptable behavior. Understanding and condoning are not the same. Receiving empathically is 50% of communication. Listening is just as essential as speaking to foster open, honest, and compassionate relationships. That covers the essential highlights about receiving empathically according to Rosenberg's teachings. Please let me know if you would like me to explain anything in the summary in more detail. Here is a summary. Empathy requires focused attention and presence. It is the ability to understand someone else's experience and perspectives. Avoid giving advice, reassurance or explaining our position. Instead, listen thoroughly to understand the other person. Ask open-ended questions to make sure you understand their feelings and needs. Common behaviors that prevent empathy include, advising, one-upping, educating, consoling, storytelling, shutting down, sympathizing, interrogating, explaining, and correcting. Listen for the observations, feelings, needs, and requests behind the words. Try understanding the underlying feelings and needs, not just the thoughts expressed. Paraphrase to reflect on what you understand about the other person's observations, feelings, needs, and requests. Use questions to check your understanding and invite correction. For example, are you hurt because you wanted more appreciation? When asking questions to gain understanding, first express your feelings and needs. For example, say I am frustrated because I want to understand better. Would you tell me what I did to lead you to see me this way? Determine if paraphrasing or reflecting would be helpful based on the context and your relationship. It may not always be necessary or appropriate. However, when emotions are high, it can help to prevent misunderstanding and confirm that you understand the other person. The key points are developing empathy through focused listening, understanding feelings and needs, avoiding judgment, and reflecting on gaining clarity and inviting correction. The goal is to connect with the other person's experience, not just understand their thoughts. With practice, these skills can transform relationships and prevent conflict. However, empathy is challenging, and we all have more to learn. Here is a summary. Paraphrase emotionally charged messages to show you understand. This provides reassurance and connection. Only paraphrase when it contributes to greater compassion and understanding. Could you not do it mechanically? Consider cultural norms. Your tone of voice when paraphrasing is important. It should communicate that you are checking if you understood, not claiming you did. Expect that your intention in paraphrasing may sometimes be misinterpreted. Stay focused on the other person's feelings and needs. See criticism as an appeal to meet needs. Difficult messages are opportunities to enrich others' lives. Look behind intimidating messages to see the unmet needs. Examine your intentions if people regularly distrust your motives in paraphrasing. Ensure you are focused on connecting with the person, not just applying a technique. Paraphrasing saves time by reducing misunderstandings and creating connection. People feel heard and understood. Allow others to express themselves fully before turning to solutions or requests. This conveys your genuine interest in their feelings and needs. An initial message may be the tip of the iceberg. Reflect feelings and needs to encourage someone to look within. This can lead to deeper sharing and insight. Your reflection may be the first time they felt fully understood. Empathy sustains connection and understanding. Make sure reflections come from a place of sincerity and care. Your tone and body language should match your words. 
Sometimes just listening without response is the most empathic response. Your silence can give space for the other person to gain insight and feel understood. Follow their lead and when to respond. Summary, the key points in this example are, the wife was initially unable to connect emotionally with her dying husband. Through empathic listening by the nurse, the wife became aware of her feelings and desired to connect with her husband. The wife explicitly requested the nurse to talk to her husband like the nurse had. This request empowered the nurse to help facilitate an emotional connection between the couple. The husband was hesitant to express his feelings about dying. With empathic guessing and prompts from the nurse, he eventually articulated that he was worried about how his wife would cope without him. Expressing feelings precisely helps with emotional connection. The nurse encouraged the husband to move from describing his feelings as not good to identifying his specific feelings of worry for his wife. Dying patients often need reassurance that loved ones will be okay before they feel ready to let go. The nurse recognized the husband's worry for his wife as something that could hold him back from fully accepting his death. The key elements of NBC demonstrated here are, empathic listening, making clear requests, empathic guessing, and expressing feelings precisely. With compassion and skill, the nurse facilitated an emotional connection between the couple during this difficult time. Here are the main points I understood from this section. Empathy allows us to see the world in new ways and move forward. Feeling honestly heard and understood without judgment can lead to powerful shifts in perception and resolve inner conflicts. We can provide empathy through attentive listening without trying to fix or advise the other person. Even young children can teach us the power of empathetic listening. Empathizing with others helps us feel safer expressing our vulnerability. As we connect with the humanity in others, we realize we share the exact fundamental needs and desires. This makes it easier to open up. It can be more difficult to empathize with those who seem to hold more power or authority over us. However, empathizing with them as fellow human beings can help diffuse tensions and create mutual understanding. Expressing vulnerability when interacting with those who seem threatening requires empathy, both for them and for ourselves. Seeing the feelings and needs behind their behavior and our reactions can help us stay connected to our shared humanity. This allows us to express ourselves openly without shame. Being vulnerable is critical to empathy and compassionate communication. Though it may feel frightening, it allows for authentic connection and conflict resolution. With practice, expressing vulnerability becomes easier. Does this summary accurately reflect this section's key points about empathy, vulnerability, and compassionate communication? Let me know if you have any other insights or interpretations to add. I am still learning, so your feedback helps deepen my understanding. Here's a summary. The ability to offer empathy can help diffuse potential violence or conflict. By listening for the feelings and needs behind someone's anger or aggression, we can help them feel understood and shift the dynamic. A teacher prevented a potential assault by empathizing with a young man threatening her. A police officer diffused a hostile crowd by reflecting on their feelings about an arrest he was making. A young woman prevented a man from slitting her throat by listening for the feelings and needs behind his anger. When we focus on others' feelings and needs, we no longer see them as monsters. We can see their humanity and understand their pain or despair. This allows us to respond with compassion rather than fear or judgment. It can be most challenging to empathize with those closest to us, like family members. However, listening to the feelings and needs behind their reactions to us is essential. Empathizing with someone's no or refusal protects us from taking it personally. By tuning into the other person's feelings and needs, we can understand what prevents them from responding as we would like. We see their no is not about us, but about them. The key is to look beyond someone's angry behavior or refusal to tune into the feelings and human needs driving it. With understanding and empathy, the dynamic can shift and conflict can abate. Responding to the other's humanity brings out the best in our own. Here's a summary. The author describes several examples of empathizing with silence. In the first example, he cried while speaking to staff at a business. The director responded with silence and turned away. The author assumed the director felt disgusted but checked this assumption by asking the director directly. It turned out the director's silence expressed his discomfort with emotions, not disgust. In the second example, the author worked with a mute 20-year-old woman. For several sessions, she has yet to respond or speak. He continued empathizing with her feelings and needs through reflecting them verbally and expressing his own. On the fourth day, he held her hand. She tensed up then relaxed. The next day, she gave him a note asking for help to express herself. After more encouragement, she began speaking slowly. A year later, she shared journal entries describing emerging from her silence and sharing with the author. The key message is to empathize with silence by listening for the feelings and needs it expresses rather than making negative assumptions. With patience and empathy, 
silence can be transformed into connection and communication. Here is a summary, compassionate connection with ourselves is crucial. When internally violent towards ourselves, being genuinely compassionate toward others is hard. We have forgotten our specialness and why we were born human. We view ourselves as objects full of shortcomings, so we relate violently to ourselves. We need to evaluate ourselves in ways that promote growth rather than self-hatred. How we speak to ourselves after mistakes often implies that we deserve to suffer. We want change motivated by enriching life, not shame or guilt. We should avoid should and must when evaluating ourselves. These words imply a lack of choice and lead to resistance and lack of joy. When we judge ourselves, we say we are not meeting our needs. We need to evaluate ourselves in terms of whether our needs are met, to inspire change out of self-compassion rather than self-hatred. We can translate self-judgments into underlying unmet needs. This produces productive feelings like sadness or frustration rather than shame and guilt. NVC morning means fully connecting with the unmet needs and feelings from our imperfect actions. This leads to learning without self-blame. We see how we did not meet our needs, feel the resulting feelings, and become open to new possibilities. Moralistic self-judgments obscure learning and possibilities, perpetuating self-punishment. NVC morning stimulates creativity and growth. In summary, we must cultivate self-compassion by evaluating our actions based on whether our needs were met, translating self-judgments into unmet needs, and fully mourning when we make mistakes to promote learning and growth rather than perpetuating self-hatred. This is key to both personal well-being and compassion for others. Here is a summary, we can practice self-forgiveness by connecting with the need we were trying to meet when we took an action we now regret. This allows us to have compassion for ourselves. An example is Marshall Rosenberg ruining a new suit by leaving an uncapped pen in the pocket. After initially berating himself, he connected with a need to take better care of himself underlying his action. He also saw that his rushing to meet others' needs led to his failure to meet his own need. This allowed him to forgive himself. Rosenberg recommends only taking actions motivated by the desire to contribute to life, rather than fear, guilt, shame, duty or obligation. Even though complex actions can be playful when conscious of the life-enriching purpose behind our actions, actions are done for obligation lose their joy. We can cultivate awareness of the energy behind our actions by, listing things we do that we do not experience as playful or dread but do anyway because we feel we have no choice. Acknowledging that we choose to do these things. Replace have to with choose to. Identify our choices intention by completing the statement I choose to because I want underscore. This helps us connect with the need the action serves. The motivations behind our actions could be, money, deprives us of joy and meaning. Money is a strategy, not a need. Approval, like money, is an extrinsic reward conditioned into us. It deprives us of self-motivation and joy. Fear of punishment, makes our lives small and joyless. We can reclaim our power by connecting with the needs behind our actions. Obligation, often passed down from past authorities and deprived life of meaning and joy. We can question whether we choose an obligation. By cultivating awareness of the energy behind our actions, we can experience more joy and meaning. We reclaim our power of choice and connect with our needs and values. Here is a summary, anger is often expressed superficially through blaming or hurting others. This is not fully expressing the anger. To fully express anger in NBC, first divorce the other person from responsibility for your anger. Their actions may be the stimulus for your anger but not the cause. The cause lies in your thoughts of judgment and blame. We are never angry because of what others say or do. Their actions are only the stimulus. The cause is always our thoughts. Many languages and cultures promote the confusion of stimulus and cause by using guilt and judgment to manipulate others. However, the truth is that others do not make us feel a certain way, our feelings come from within us. The cause of anger is the thought of blame or judgment about the other person. We are choosing to play God by making them wrong. The alternative to anger is connecting with our feelings and needs. How we feel depends on what need is or is not being met at that moment, not what the other person does. Our needs, not their actions, cause our feelings. When connected to our needs, we may have strong feelings but do not judge or blame others. We stay connected to our life energy. This is fully expressing ourselves without anger. The key lessons are, separate stimulus and cause, the cause of your feelings is always within you, and connect to your needs rather than judging others. This allows you to express yourself fully while also remaining compassionate. Here is a summary, anger results from judgmental, life-alienating thinking disconnected from our needs. It indicates we have moved into our heads to analyze and judge someone rather than focus on our unmet needs. There are four options when we receive a problematic message, 
Blame ourselves blame others sense our feelings and needs sense others feelings and needs the third and fourth options help avoid anger. We see the other person's humanity and connect with our own needs. All anger has an unmet need at its core. We can use anger as an alarm to wake us up to our needs and thoughts that make it unlikely our needs will be met. Expressing anger fully requires awareness of our needs. Anger diverts energy toward punishing others rather than meeting needs. The stimulus for anger is outside us, but the cause is our thinking. We are not angry because of what others do but because of how we interpret their actions. Our interpretations, images, and labels produce anger. Focusing on our needs replaces anger with life-serving feelings like fear or sadness. Judging others contributes to self-fulfilling prophecies and violence. When we judge others as immoral, greedy, or irresponsible, they are unlikely to care about our needs. Even if we intimidate them into meeting our needs, we lose by creating more violence and defensiveness. Solving one problem creates another. To fully express anger constructively, stop and breathe. Become conscious of your thinking. Connect with your unmet need. Say I am angry because I need. Express how you feel in your unmet need. Speak for yourself, not others. Request a concrete, doable action. Explain how the other person can contribute to meeting your need. Listen with empathy. Be open to hearing the other person's feelings and needs as well. Look for a solution that meets everyone's needs. Here is a summary of the steps to expressing anger through nonviolent communication. Stop. Breathe. Do nothing except breathe to avoid reacting impulsively. Stay quiet and refrain from blaming or punishing the other person. Identify your judgmental thoughts. Recognize the thoughts making you angry, such as it is unfair or she is being racist. See these thoughts as expressions of unmet needs. Connect with your needs. Determine the needs behind your angry thoughts, such as inclusion, equality, respect or connection. Express your feelings and needs. Share how the situation affected you and what you need, for example, I felt hurt and scared, I need to feel respected. Expressing your needs may require courage. Offer empathy first. Before expecting empathy from others, empathize with them to understand why they acted the way they did. This makes them more willing to reciprocate empathy for you. For example, say it seems you may have had some bad experiences that are influencing how you see this situation. Share your pain without blaming. Explain how the comments were painful without implying blame. Ask if they understand your pain. For example, can you tell me what you heard me say about how I felt? Repeat your feelings and needs until they acknowledge them. Take your time. Slow down your responses even if it feels awkward. Refer to notes on nonviolent communication if needed. Remind yourself that responding with NVC is worth the time and effort required. With practice, the process will become more natural. Practice translating judgments into needs. Please list commonly made judgments, then translate each into the need it reflects. For example, I do not like rude people may reflect a need for consideration. This helps shift your mindset to focus on unmet needs rather than judgments. The key is to express your genuine feelings and needs, understand the other person, and create mutual understanding. With practice, you can learn to respond to anger and conflict with empathy and compassion. Here is a summary of the key points. Judging, blaming, and punishing others are superficial ways of expressing anger that often lead to further conflict and distance. To resolve conflicts, express your feelings and needs rather than attributing responsibility to others. The four steps to expressing anger constructively are, 1. Stop and breathe. 2. Identify judgmental thoughts. 3. Connect with your feelings and needs. And, 4. Express your feelings and unmet needs. Empathizing with the other person can help them hear you. Practice and patience are required to apply NVC, as most of us have been raised to judge and blame. Proceed slowly, think before speaking, and sometimes do not speak. In this dialogue, a father uses NVC to resolve a conflict with his teenage son, Bill, who took a car without permission. By identifying his feelings and needs, empathizing with Bill, and making requests, the father can have an honest conversation and agree with his son to take responsibility. To resolve conflicts, apply the principles of NVC, observe objective facts, identify feelings, connect feelings to needs, and make doable requests. Express what you observe, think, feel, need, and request, not what others do. The author has used NVC to resolve conflicts worldwide by meeting with unhappy groups and empowering them to connect and meet each other's needs. The key is to focus on common ground and shared needs rather than differences. Even when others do not use NVC. Stay connected to your feelings and needs. Make explicit requests, set limits, and explain the natural consequences of not meeting needs. Be open to mutual understanding. Meet anger with empathy, not aggression.
As a mediator, create a safe space, reframe issues around feelings and needs, translate others' words, encourage direct expression, set a positive tone, share power, and make your goal empower both parties. The mediator's needs matter too. Stay self-connected. Does this summary cover the key highlights from the passage? Let me know if you want want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. Here is a summary. Connecting the people in conflict is the most crucial step. This enables understanding each other's needs and finding mutually satisfying solutions. The goal is not compromise where everyone gives something up, but meeting everyone's needs fully. NVC conflict resolution differs from traditional mediation which focuses on the issues and tries to find agreements, often without direct connection between parties. NVC focuses on connecting the parties so they can clarify their needs, then find strategies to meet all needs. The NVC conflict resolution process has five main steps. Express your own needs Seek the other party's needs behind their words Verify that you both understand the other's needs Accurately provide empathy until needs are understood Propose strategies to meet all needs In positive action language, avoid language that implies wrongness Focus on needs, not judgments Needs are universal resources required to sustain life Strategies are specific actions to meet needs Distinguish needs from strategies Lack of ability to express needs clearly and distinguish them from strategies can lead to conflict escalation. With NVC, parties can connect at the level of needs and find new strategies. An example shows how clarifying needs allowed couples to find alternatives to ending their marriage. Another shows how the confusion of needs and analysis led to violence, resolved through NVC mediation. The summary illustrates the power of NVC in enabling conflict resolution through a focus on human connection and understanding slash meeting universal human needs. Here is a summary. The couple had been in conflict over finances for 39 years. The wife had overdrawn their account early in the marriage, so the husband took control of the finances. They communicated well in other areas, but had never resolved this conflict. The mediator predicted they could resolve it within 20 minutes once they understood each other's needs. Even after trying, the wife could not identify her husband's needs. She made analyzes and diagnoses instead. The husband criticized his wife as irresponsible. The mediator guessed the husband needed to feel economically safe and protect his family. The husband agreed this was the case. However, the wife was still unable to hear her husband's needs, even when the mediator stated them, because she was in too much pain. The mediator empathized with the wife's pain before repeating the husband's needs. After hearing them a few times, she finally understood his need for safety. Once they understood each other's needs, they were able to start resolving their long-standing conflict, as the mediator predicted. The key lessons are, we must learn to identify needs, not just make analyzes and diagnoses. We must work to hear others' needs, even when they are expressed imperfectly. It takes practice and guessing. When others are in pain, we must show empathy before they can truly hear us. Understanding each other's needs is critical to resolving conflicts. Here is a summary. The key to resolving conflicts is to focus on meeting everyone's needs rather than trying to get them to do what they want. Using present, positive action language helps clarify what each party needs and wants. Stating requests in concrete, actionable terms using active verbs helps avoid misunderstandings. It is essential to not hear no as rejection but to listen for the unmet need behind it and find an alternative strategy. As a mediator, remember that the role is to support the parties in connecting and meeting each other's needs rather than accomplishing our own goals. Expressing empathy for one side can make the other feel favored, so emergency first aid empathy helps reassure them they will be heard. The mediator must carefully follow the exchange to understand each party's needs and requests to guide them to a mutually agreeable solution. With patience and compassion, NVC provides a process for resolving long-standing conflicts. Here is a summary. Pay close attention to what each party is saying and make sure both parties have a chance to express their needs. Listen for the critical needs and requests being expressed. Follow the bouncing ball, track where each party left off, expressing their needs so you can return the floor to them. This can be done visually, like using a whiteboard. This helps reassure the parties that their needs will be addressed. Stay focused on the present moment, on the current needs and requests. Although past events and future desires may arise, redirect the conversation to the here and now. Keep the conversation moving to avoid getting bogged down in repeated stories. Ask questions and maintain an appropriate pace. Using roleplay can help speed up the process. Interrupt when needed to refocus the parties, especially if the conversation gets heated. Give empathy to help the parties reconnect with their needs and requests. The goal is to restore the mediation process. 
Find ways to resolve conflicts even when parties are unwilling to meet face to face. One option is using an audio recorder to convey each party's needs through role play. This can help build trust and openness to further dialogue. The keys are paying close attention, focusing on current needs, and taking action to restore the mediation process when it breaks down. With patience and persistence, conflicts can be resolved even in difficult situations. The mediator plays a vital role in facilitating this resolution. Here is a summary. Using force may be necessary to protect life or rights when communication is not possible or practical. There are two types of force, protective force and punitive force. Protective force prevents harm and is not meant to punish or blame. The intention is to protect and educate, not condemn. Punitive force is meant to punish and make someone suffer for a perceived wrong. Physical punishment like spanking is an example of punitive force. It can generate resentment and hostility in children and teach them that violence is an acceptable solution to problems. Fear of physical punishment can prevent children from understanding the compassion behind their parents' demands. Many parents feel they have no choice but to influence their children, but there are concerns about using physical punishment. Here is a summary. Punishment has high costs and limitations. It diminishes self-esteem, focuses people on consequences rather than values, and reduces goodwill. Two key questions reveal the limitations of punishment. What do I want this person to do? Punishment may influence behavior. What do I want this person's reasons for doing it? Punishment interferes with desired reasons. The author describes using protective force, not punishment, to establish order in an alternative school. Through empathic dialogue, students suggested alternatives like a do-nothing room for disruptive students. This helped address the critical issue of students bothering those who wanted to learn, without using punishment. The students initially suggested punishment like corporal punishment or suspension to control behavior, showing their belief that these were the only practical options. However, alternative solutions that did not rely on punishment were identified through empathic dialogue. The goal was establishing order through mutually agreeable solutions, not force compliance through punishment. Protective force involves setting clear rules to prevent harm and engaging in empathic dialogue. This is contrasted with punitive force using punishment to gain control over others. In summary, the key ideas are, that punishment has significant downsides and limitations. Alternatives to punishment should be sought through empathic dialogue. The protective force that sets clear rules, not punitive force, should be used to maintain order. The anecdote about the alternative school illustrates these concepts in action. Here is a summary, we have all internalized cultural conditioning and beliefs that limit us, though we are often unaware of them. NVC helps bring these limiting beliefs into awareness so we can transform them. We can apply NVC to resolve internal conflicts and address conditions like depression. Identifying the judgmental voices in our head and translating their messages into feelings and needs helps create understanding and empathy for ourselves. This can free us from alienating self-messages and the depression that results. Focusing on our needs and wants rather than what went wrong helps us establish a healthy internal environment. Asking ourselves what we need to do to care for ourselves in the present moment diffuses stressful thoughts. Translating our judgments of others into feelings and needs diffuses anger and creates inner peace. Giving ourselves empathy for our feelings and needs in tense situations alleviates stress and protects our well-being. The key message is that NVC helps us gain awareness of the cultural conditioning and beliefs that cause inner turmoil, conflict, and stress. By translating judgmental thoughts into feelings and needs, we can resolve internal conflicts, address conditions like depression, establish a healthy inner environment, and reduce anger and stress. The ability to empathize with ourselves is profoundly liberating. Does this summary accurately reflect the key ideas presented in the section? Let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. Here is a summary. Marshall Rosenberg grew dissatisfied with the conventional approach to psychotherapy that relied on diagnosis, interpretation, and emotional distance. He was influenced by Martin Buber's belief that authentic human growth occurs through an eye relationship based on vulnerability and empathy. Rosenberg experimented with bringing himself fully into the relationship with his clients by empathizing with them and revealing his feelings, rather than diagnosing them. This approach was initially frightening and unconventional, but Rosenberg found it gratifying for himself and his clients. Over time, it has become more accepted. Rosenberg rejects diagnosis in favor of trying to understand people's feelings and needs. He believes diagnosis often does not lead to effective treatment plans and can be unreliable and subjective. Rosenberg demonstrated NVC with a group of people diagnosed with chronic schizophrenics. At first, he slipped into a clinical mindset and wrongly attributed a misunderstanding to a patient's confusion. However, the exercise went well overall, 
and staff were impressed with the patient's ability to engage. Rosenberg had difficulty helping one psychiatrist distinguish between intellectual understanding and empathy. The psychiatrist kept interpreting people's feelings rather than empathizing with them. A patient pointed out that the psychiatrist was doing it again. Rosenberg believes that by using NVC, counselors can have open, mutual, and genuine encounters with clients rather than rely on the hierarchical dynamic of diagnosis. NVC can help counselors and clients achieve inner peace by connecting with feelings and needs. The key ideas are using empathy and vulnerability instead of diagnosis, revealing one's feelings rather than interpreting others, and focusing on understanding people's feelings and needs to achieve mutual understanding. An authentic avow relationship based on empathy is superior to the conventional counselor-client dynamic based on hierarchy and distance. Here is a summary of the key points. Expressing appreciation in NVC focuses on what the speaker genuinely feels and needs, not on judging or manipulating the other person. The intention is to celebrate how the speaker's life has been enriched. NVC appreciation includes three components, the specific actions that contributed to the speaker's well-being. Say exactly what the other person did that you appreciated. The speaker's needs that were fulfilled. Explain how those actions met your needs. The pleasant feelings that arose from having your needs met. Share the feelings of joy or relief that the other person's actions engendered in you. A simple thank you may convey all three components but elaborating on them helps ensure the appreciation is fully received. Provide all three pieces of information, this is what you did, this is how I feel, this is the need of mine that was met. Avoid judgments, even positive ones, when expressing appreciation. Rather than calling someone brilliant or kind, specify the actions they took and the needs those actions fulfilled. Judgments are less meaningful and can feel manipulative. Receiving appreciation expressed in NVC leads to more significant learning and enjoyment for the recipient. With all three components spelled out, the recipient understands how their actions benefited the speaker. Does this help summarize the critical points about expressing appreciation through nonviolent communication? Let me know if you have any other questions. Here is a summary of the key points. Appreciation expressed in NVC is solely for celebration, not judgment or manipulation. We share, 1. The specific action, 2 the need that was fulfilled, and, three, the pleasant feelings engendered. To receive appreciation gracefully, hear the message with empathy, the action contributing to the other's well-being, feelings, and fulfilled needs. Receive it without feelings of superiority or false humility. Celebrate that we can enrich each other's lives. We often yearn to receive genuine appreciation and recognition. We tend to notice what is wrong rather than right but we can choose instead to develop the habit of appreciating what works well and expressing that to others. We may feel reluctant to express appreciation due to assumed embarrassment, feeling our words will not justify our feelings, or assuming the other person already knows. However, sincerely expressed appreciation is virtually always welcome and meaningful. Anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. To express appreciation, state the specific actions, the needs that were met, and the pleasant feelings you experienced. Share from the heart, your genuineness will come through. Appreciation expressed before it is too late can be a cherished gift. Receive appreciation by hearing the message with empathy, celebrating that we can contribute to each other's lives. Avoid feelings of superiority or false humility. Even when words seem inadequate, any expression of appreciation can be meaningful. Our appreciation of others enriches both ourselves and our relationships. That covers the essence of appreciating and receiving appreciation in a nutshell. Please let me know if you have any other questions. Here are the four parts of nonviolent communication, also known as compassionate communication, observations, observe the concrete actions affecting our well-being without evaluating or interpreting them. Speak about specific observations and avoid generalizations. For example, say you left the dishes in the sink last night rather than you never do any chores. Feelings, express how those observations impact you without blaming others for the feeling. Say, I feel frustrated or I feel sad rather than I feel like you do not care. Needs, express the underlying needs, values, or desires connected to your feelings. For example, say I need support or I value clarity. Avoid thinking about specific actions as the only way needs can be met. Requests, clearly and concretely ask for what you need to enrich your life without demanding. For example, Ask would you be willing to put your dishes in the dishwasher tonight? Rather than you have to do your chores right now. Focus on actions the other party can do, rather than what they should do. Requests start with would you be willing to. The four parts aim to increase compassionate understanding between people to meet the most critical needs and improve the well-being of all. 
the process encourages us to take responsibility for our intentions and actions rather than relying on judgments about other people's faults. By expressing ourselves this way, we open our hearts as well as the hearts of others. Here is a summary of the key points, observations, what I observe, see, hear, remember, imagine, that does or does not contribute to my well-being, when I, see, hear, what you observe, see, hear, remember, imagine, that does or does not contribute to your well-being, when you see slash hear, feelings, how I feel, emotion or sensation rather than thought, about what I observe, I feel, how you feel, emotion or sensation rather than thought, about what you observe, you feel, needs, what I need or value, rather than a preference, or a specific action, that causes my feelings, because I need slash value, what you need or value, rather than a preference, or a specific action, that causes your feelings, because you need slash value, requests, the concrete actions I would like to take, would you be willing to, the concrete actions you would like taken, would you like, some basic feelings we all have include when needs are fulfilled, amazed, comfortable, confident, or unfulfilled, angry, annoyed, confused, some basic needs we all have include, autonomy, choosing dreams slash goals slash values, choosing plans celebration, celebrating life, dreams, losses integrity, authenticity, creativity, meaning, self-worth interdependence, acceptance, appreciation, closeness, community, contribution, emotional safety, empathy, honesty, love, reassurance, respect, support, trust, understanding physical nurturance, air, food, movement, protection, rest, sex, shelter, touch, water play, fun, laughter spiritual communion, beauty, harmony, inspiration, order, peace nonviolent communication, NVC, helps people reach the root cause of violence and pain by meeting universal human needs. NVC is teachable and provides practical skills for improving professional and personal relationships. Puddle Dancer Press publishes NVC related materials to promote compassionate communication. The Center for Nonviolent Communication, founded in 1984, provides training and supports teaching NVC worldwide. Here is a summary, the message says, it works. It then provides descriptions and details of books on nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg and related topics like compassionate communication in the classroom. The books cover how to apply nonviolent communication to improve relationships, resolve conflicts, enhance productivity and address challenges in various areas of life including at work, home, and education. According to the authors, the summaries highlight some key concepts and benefits of nonviolent communication. The message appears to be a promotional email from the Center for Nonviolent Communication to market their publications on nonviolent communication. Here is a summary. Marshall B. Rosenberg founded the Center for Nonviolent Communication, an international organization that promotes peace. He authored 15 books, including the bestseller Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life. Before passing in 2015, Rosenberg traveled to over 60 countries teaching nonviolent communication. He received numerous awards for his work promoting peace, including the Bridge of Peace Nonviolence Award and the International Peace Prayer Day Man of Peace Award. Rosenberg first used nonviolent communication in the 1960s to provide mediation during school integration. The Center for Nonviolent Communication, which he founded in 1984, now has hundreds of certified trainers teaching nonviolent communication worldwide. Rosenberg led workshops for tens of thousands of people across the globe, training educators, healthcare workers, military officials, and government leaders in nonviolent communication. To promote peace, he worked in war torn areas, including Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and the Middle East. With his guitar, puppets, and spiritual presence, Rosenberg showed people how to create a more peaceful world. Book link, click here.